Hello. Thank you for joining our weekly Bible study. We're glad to have you with us, and we hope that this is a time for blessing for all of us. Today, I can't think of a better scripture to share than Matthew chapter 6, beginning with verse 25, which is uh, Jesus' advice in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount about not worrying. He says, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more important than food, and the body more important than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your Heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? And who of you can add a single hour to your life by worry? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the lilies of the field grow. They do not labor or spin, yet I tell you, not even Solomon in all of his splendor was dressed like one of those flowers. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow was thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? For lots of other people run around after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. This is going to be a much shorter Bible study than usual because we find that uploading it to YouTube works better if it's under 15 minutes. So we're going to look at some things rather quickly but left for you to ponder in the days ahead. And then those who would like can join us by Zoom on Monday, and we'll have some discussion of it. But as I looked at these verses, obviously the recurring theme is don't worry. And to offer this scripture now at a time of tremendous worry, uh, we hope is very helpful and very inspiring, even though it's also challenging. But I think what's fascinating is to see that this is in the middle of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. It's the longest teaching, continuous teaching we have from Jesus. And in the middle of it, he says, don't worry. So what precedes it? What enables Jesus to look out at people whose everyday life was full of good reasons to worry, and yet at the same time say, don't worry? Well, if you go back to Matthew chapter 5, the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus begins with the Beatitudes. And most of us know the Beatitudes as blessed are the meek, blessed are the pure in heart, blessed are the peacemakers, blessed are they that mourn, the word blessed. But the actual meaning of the word blessed is how happy. So the Beatitudes are the ways to true happiness. And he says, blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are they that mourn, blessed are the meek, blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, blessed are the merciful, Blessed are the pure in heart, the peacemakers, and even those who are persecuted. Those people, so strong in their faith, so strong in their own identity, as faithful people, those are the people who are on the path to true happiness. And then, as the Sermon on the Mount goes on, Jesus calls us the salt of the earth. We're the people who add taste to the world around us. And Jesus says we're the light of the world, so that people are able to see Jesus actually says, see our good deeds, see what we're made of, see what we do with our faith. Then he says, redirecting a lot of the laws. He looks at oaths. He said, you've heard it said, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. He says, no, no, don't be that kind of person. And then he also says, you've heard it said, don't kill, don't commit adultery. But he goes even deeper saying, don't be angry, don't be lustful. Don't be sexist in your thinking and behavior. Don't be the kind of person that is either hurtful of other people or making other people uncomfortable. And then he says, love your enemies. Give to those who are in need. Learn how to pray. Practice spiritual self-discipline. And then he says, no one can serve two masters, God and mammon, or God and greed, or God and money. You've got to have your priorities straight. So if we become that kind of person, from the Beatitudes all the way to someone who's focused on God's way and God's will, someone who's managed to overcome 
uh, those emotions in our life that are hurtful to others, whether it's treating people like enemies or whether it's being hurtful to them in any way, when we are that kind of a person, then we're less likely to be prone to worry. That's the foundation. So with all of that in place, then we're able to look at our daily life, even our daily life right now, and put things in perspective. So that when Jesus says, don't worry, we're actually able to make sense of that. Now, let's look at what he says, don't worry about. He says, don't worry about life. Don't worry about what you have to eat or drink. Don't worry what you're going to wear. Don't worry about how you appear to others. Don't worry about what others think about you. Keep your focus on what's truly important. And there's that lovely verse, which is made into a lovely chorus that we often sing at church. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and its righteousness. And then those things, those things that we're prone to worry about, that we're inclined to worry about, those things will fall into place. So what are the lessons to be learned from this rather amazing scripture? I mean, let's admit it. We, we live at a time where to turn on the morning news, to, to read the paper, uh, to check your news feed on, on the internet, uh, to get caught up with your family and loved ones by phone or however you're in touch with them, all of those things would seem to lend itself to worry, to add to our worries. And yet, obviously, these are unusual times, critical times. I'm not underestimating that in the least. But these words of Jesus were spoken 2,000 years ago when life was already full of difficulties. In fact, Jesus ends this teaching by saying, in effect, you know, every day has got enough worries of its own. So for you to ruin the day before, the week before, and the month before worrying about it isn't actually going to accomplish anything. So I think there are a couple of quick lessons that we can look at. Uh, first, he says rather starkly, uh, who can add one hour to their life or one inch to their stature by worry. I love baseball. I played baseball all of my youth. I definitely wanted to play in the major leagues. But I was five foot six. That wasn't going to happen. And I didn't spend my life trying to figure out how to make myself five foot nine or six foot one in order to accomplish my dream. I was five foot six. I did the best I could with my five foot six. But I didn't waste time and waste energy worrying about something that I couldn't do anything about. I have a, a dear friend of mine, an opera singer, and he often uh, said to me, and I've, I've treasured it ever since, he said, only worry about the things over which you have control, the things that you can actually do something about. And that leads to the second point, the difference between actually doing something about something and worrying about it. At least the way I look at worry versus planning or worry versus preparation. I, I think of worry as that which is paralytic, uh, that which puts you in such a tizzy you can't actually do anything constructively. So you're bound up in your worry, you're caught up in your fears, you can't move, you can't think, you can't plot and plan, you can't put one foot in front of the other in order to accomplish what needs to be accomplished. That, I think, is what Jesus is getting at when he says don't worry. He's not saying don't plan, he's saying don't worry. Don't get so caught up in the negative side of things that you're not able to do that which could be on the positive side of things. Don't worry means don't let yourself be so full of fear that you're paralyzed in that fear. And instead, move toward planning, toward preparing. And I think that's what uh, all of us are trying to do now. How do we prepare ourselves for however long the shutdown might be, however isolated we have to be. What do we do with our time? What do we do with our loved ones who are far away from us? How do we stay in touch? How do we make sure that we have enough supplies in the home? All of that doesn't take worry. All of that takes us having the kind of freedom and liberation uh, to be able to do that which has to be done. The ultimate lesson for me is to prepare not to worry. Uh, we've often heard, not in, in these difficult times, but just life in general, about how it's important. Boy, if you were a scout, you probably heard, be prepared. Or there probably have been times, depending on what stage you are in your life, when somebody said, 
you know, you really need to be uh, planning. You need to put your house in order. Uh, do you have everything lined up financially, uh, spiritually, emotionally, relationally? All of that is a way of saying, then you're ready for the future. Um, I had a funeral this morning. Uh, a dear, lovely lady who, who lived a, a wonderful and, and full life, uh, a church-based life, a, a faithful life. And when we were together with the family and when I was with her in the final weeks of her life, she was able to look back at her life with no regrets, but able to think of its fulfillment, its joys, its accomplishments, and all of that which put a smile on her face throughout her life. And so when the time comes to let go of this life, or the time comes for you and I to let go of what we think of as normal or our daily routine or the plans that we had for after Easter or for the summer break or for graduating from high school or college, those plans now are uncertain or they may have actually been taken away from us. But if we're the kind of person that's rooted in faith, both in the long term and the short term, we're ready to face whatever it is that comes down the pike. And for me, that's the final lesson of these scriptures. Uh, God constantly throughout the scriptures tries to give us the long view and the big picture to look at eternity and be prepared for eternity. And if we're prepared for eternity, then we're much more at peace and at ease and comfortable with today. Two closing verses for today. First from St. Peter, uh, his first letter, chapter 5, verse 7. Cast all your anxiety on Christ because he cares for you. Cast all your anxiety on Christ because he cares for you. And then Philippians chapter 4, verse 6, the same message. Do not be anxious about anything. By prayer and petitions with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. Do not be anxious about anything, but don't give up. He's saying don't worry about it, but take those concerns that you have. We all have concerns. And then be proactive with them. And one of the ways to be proactive with them, he actually says, by prayer and petition. You know, make your list, present it to God in your prayer life, and say, these are the concerns that weigh heavy upon my heart. We use that phrase all the time in church on Sunday. These are the concerns that weigh heavy upon our heart. Bring them to God. And in that way, you'll begin to be able to release them, at least as worries. They remain as concerns, but they won't be burdensome on you in the way that a worry that you can do nothing about is. Let's conclude with a word of prayer. Loving God, we're grateful for the message that you gave 2,000 years ago, asking us to have enough confidence in you, enough trust in you, enough knowing of you and your love for us that we can set aside our worries and instead do the things that we have control over in order to settle our lives for today and tomorrow and tomorrow's tomorrow. Through Christ our Lord we pray. Amen. God bless you.